and web snapper. Stan Lee and Steve Ditko introduced the world to Peter Parker in 1962. In 1967, he was given a voice. Ouch, something bit me. It was just a spider. Why do I feel so strange, so different? What's come over me? I, I'm scaling this wall just as easily as I can walk. I might as well call myself Spider-Man. Okay, world, better hang on to your hat. You're about to meet the original web-swinging wonder. Hello, this is Paul Souls, the original voice of your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Let me introduce you to the men and women who first portrayed in sound the enduring characters from Marvel's The Amazing Spider-Man. Why were the tracks recorded in Toronto with Canadian actors? Stay tuned. From its inception in the 1930s, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation has nurtured an extraordinary radio acting community. One of its principal admirers was Orson Welles, at a time when radio storytelling was still and often the only primetime family entertainment. Most of these shows originated in Canada's largest English-speaking city, Toronto. Searching for a pool of talented performers readily available and prepared to work for reasonable rates, New York producers found a veteran CBC announcer-producer in Bernard Cowan. Thus began a relationship that built an industry. It began in the late 50s. It flourished for 20 years. Pinocchio, Wizard of Oz, and Return to Oz were early productions. Later, there were others like the Marvel superheroes, Rocket Robin Hood, Professor Kitzel, The Spirit of 76. But it was the Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer TV special in 1964 that put the Toronto industry on the map. NBC producers Arthur Rankin Jr. and Jules Bass mounted a full-scale presentation of the Rudolph legend that has enchanted families now for 40 Christmases. Since I played Hermie, the misfit elf who wanted to be a dentist. Well, I'll tell you more about that show later. In 1967, ABC, through Steve Krantz, contracted Grant Trade Lawrence Animation to produce the Spider-Man cartoon project. By this time, Cowan had recruited a sizable stable of versatile voice professionals. And from his roster, he chose Paul Kligman, Peg Dixon, and myself as the principals, and offered the major villain roles to others. Join me now and meet the cast of the Spider-Man cartoon. She was a tall, stunning brunette with a saucy disposition that was instantly endearing, just like Betty Brandt. 
and she was the quintessential long-suffering secretary to old J.J.J., friend and would-be romantic interest of Peter Parker and supporter of Spider-Man. Peg was noteworthy for supplying nearly every female voice in the series. And because she was so versatile, Peg was regularly called for network radio drama and commercial voiceovers. She was also married to Ed McNamara, who played Rhino, one of Spidey's several sinister villains. She now lives in Victoria, British Columbia, and returned to using her original given name, Melissa. Wrapped in the beauty of the Pacific Coast, she's been inspired to practice and excel in her first love, which was writing. But not just any writing. She mastered the Japanese poetic form known as hanka, a much more demanding art than haiku. Everyone called him Bunny. Bernard Cowan defined a noble breed of radio craftsmen known as far back as the 20s as announcers. They got your attention, they held it, they informed and led you through the program. Bunny did that and much more in a career that lasted over 40 years. He was co-creator of one of Canada's first national jazz radio programs, the 1010 Swing Club, and host if ever a man was born to a part, Paul Kligman was built to be J. Jonah Jameson. A hearty bull of a man in build and countenance, he was in real life gregarious, genial, and often gentle. The comedy team of Wayne and Schuster hold the record for the most appearances on The Ed Sullivan Show, and as the dependable second banana to Frank and Johnny, Paul had a role in all of their sketches. As a teenager in Winnipeg, he won the first of his many theatrical roles in The Man Who Came to Dinner. He appeared on stages across Canada, and it was in Edmonton that he achieved remarkable success playing Othello. The production was noteworthy for being the last show reviewed by Nathan Cohen, the renowned Canadian theatre critic who undertook the assignment to fulfill a promise he'd made to Paul. Happily, it was a laudatory review. While one side of Kligman's personality showed as the bombastic publisher of the Daily Bugle and gruff reindeer co- To fight the good fight and win only means something if your opponent is a worthy one. And man, did we have an assortment of the best and strangest of villains. Some were fantastic, some downright sinister, some bore grudges, some were laughable. But all were highly original. All presented Peter with a challenge that he needed all his wiles to meet. We had a wonderfully inventive cast of actors whose voices dripped with dastardly danger. At the time of the first recording sessions, I was 37 years old. A little old for comic books, even though I was a great fan of them as a kid. We had no idea back then that the show would be as popular as it has been for so long. Okay, let's get this show on the road, gang. says to me, man, greet the day like a blade of grass. Sing with the eyes, man, but dig the mower. Dig that flowing line like it's a all soul man. He must have dropped it. Roll your eyes over those crazy pajamas. Yeah, what some cats won't do to get attention. Three years before we met to begin working on Spider-Man, 
Some of us had already bonded as actors and friends on a project that became unexpected history. In 1964, stop-motion animation gave colorful life to Robert L. May's endearing story of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Of the 12 principal actors in the Rudolph Company, nine would return to voice the Spider-Man cartoon. Paul Kligman was Rudolph's demanding father, Donner, Carl Bannis, the overbearing foreman of elves, Alfie Scop, the sad Charlie in the box, Peg Dixon, the devoted Mrs. Claus, myself as the earnest Hermie, who sings two enchanting songs with his fellow misfit Rudolph, and Bernard Cowan, Clarice's disciplinarian father. He was also the dialogue supervisor for the program. Now for the woman who played Rudolph. That's right, a woman. Throughout her long career, Billy Mae Richards has always been the one to call when a little boy's voice is required. Though she stands only four feet ten, Billy has become hugely famous for her charming portrayal of Rudolph. And she is still amazed that something that took only two days to produce in the studio has endured for 40 years. That she's earned praise from her children and grandchildren is a source of great pride. That the program has become a wholesome classic, ranking alongside others like A Christmas Carol and It's a Wonderful Life as enduring Yuletide family entertainment is immensely satisfying to her.